right, I think it's slowing down now, so I think we might be um, ready to go. Um, so hello uh, and good evening. Um, my name is Helena and uh, thank you so much for joining us today at this webinar on MS Research. Um, I work for the information and engagement team here at the MS Trust. And I hope you can all see and hear me okay. Uh, if you're having any technical difficulties, put, please put a comment in the chat box. Um, it's the uh, button at the bottom of the screen and our technician will try to help. Uh, and you may have noticed that you can't see any of the other webinar attendees on your screen, um, apart from the panelists. And that's the same for everyone, including myself and the speakers. So although we'll be recording today's session, your privacy will be protected. So if you're sitting there and having a bit of dinner, I'm a bit jealous, uh, but don't worry, I can't see what you're actually eating. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar with the work of the MS Trust, um, we're here for everyone affected by MS from the moment of diagnosis. Uh, we work to make sure that people affected by MS can access good quality specialist care and live the best life they possibly can. And we do this by supporting and training your MS health professionals and funding MS specialist nurses and advanced MS uh, champions across the UK. And we also produce practical evidence-based information online and in print and our dedicated inquiry service team uh, is a friendly and knowledgeable voice to speak to for anyone who needs to know more about MS. Uh, and tonight's webinar is going to be, like I said already, uh, around research and MS. And the world of MS research is a very active one. Uh, and we've seen lots of exciting trials being announced. And in this session, we will discuss what it's like to be taking part in a clinical trial and what clinical trials are currently recruiting and how can you get involved. So we are very pleased tonight to be joined by Alistair Coles, Klaus Schmierer and Faisal Sheikh. And um, Alistair Coles, he is a professor of neuroimmunology at the University of Cambridge. And Professor Coles has been involved in a lot of different um, areas of research and is currently heading up the Cambridge Centre for Myelin Repair. We probably will talk to us a little bit about later. And then we've got uh, Klaus Schmierer, who is a professor of neurology at Queen Mary University and Bath's Health NHS Trust. And he's currently recruiting for the Chariot MS trial, which you might or may not have heard about, uh, which is a trial for people with progressive MS, and he will be telling us about tonight. And finally, we got Faisal Sheikh, who is a person with MS who's previously taken part in a clinical trial, uh, actually one of the trials um, that Professor Coles had run at Cambridge. Right, so in the terms of uh, what we're actually doing today. Uh, we're going to start uh, with uh, chatting to Professor Coles uh, for 10 minutes uh, about clinical trials. Uh, and then Professor Shmir will do a 10 minute presentation about chariot, ch chariot MS, sorry. And then we will speak to Faisal, who will discuss his personal experience of taking part in clinical trials. And meanwhile, if you have any questions for our speakers, uh, please pop them in the Q&A box then at the bottom of the screen. Uh, and then we will filter them through uh, for the end of when everybody's finished talking. And then we will pick the questions out um, as many as we possibly can fit in, um, because the webinar will last between 45 and minutes and to one hour. So I think that's all the housekeeping. Um, so I think first, starting off then, a big welcome to uh, Alistair Coles, who's going to chat to us about the ins and outs of uh, clinical trials. Hi, Alistair. Hi, Helena. Thank you so much for inviting me. So shall we start by <laughs> talking about what is a clinical trial and how do they work? Yeah, well, I'm a real fan of clinical trials and I want to um, take this opportunity to really encourage people to take part and support clinical trials. Um, and just to give a brief background, I've been involved and I've run 12 clinical trials, which may sound a lot or a little, depending on your vantage point. So I've done two trials where we've given a drug that has never been given to a human before, to either a healthy person or someone with MS. So that's called a phase one trial, where you're really looking to see, does this drug work at any level and is it safe? Then I've done several phase two trials, which is um, when you would give a drug that you know a little bit about uh, to a group of say 50 to 100 people with MS. And really you're asking the question there, do we see some signs that this drug has an impact on MS? 
and that's usually by measuring MRI scans or some other measure. And is it reasonably safe? And if the answers are yes to those, you then go on to a phase three trial. And these are the really big trials that people will have heard of, they've heard their names, and they tend to be run by pharmaceutical companies. And these are the ones that would lead to a drug getting licensed or approved uh, and um, refunded in the NHS system or, or, or wherever to enable people with MS to actually receive it. So the phase three trials are the sort of big news. Mm. And then there's phase four trials, which people may not know about. So phase four trials happen after a trial is out, after a drug is approved and is out there. And the regulatory authorities say, can you collect up information on the first thousand people uh, or whatever who are on this drug so that we can be sure that it's safe or not? Um, so for instance, Tysabri, many people will remember that, it actually failed its phase four component because uh, someone with PML was discovered. So that's back in the early 1990s. So I've done one of all of those. I've also been part of a trial which was stopped due to scientific fraud. So that was very exciting. Uh, yeah. that, was, that was fraud in, in China uh, with GSK. So I think I've you know seen most of most of the different aspects of trials. So to come to your question, what is a what is a trial? A trial is simply a way of establishing whether a treatment, usually a drug, but it could be any other form of treatment, is effective and safe for the people it's intended for. Uh, and tonight that means people with MS. And one question that we see pop up quite a lot of, of the time is, why does it take so long from that first sort of initial thought about an MS drug to when it actually gets available for people with MS? Yeah. I mean, this is so frustrating, isn't it? It's really frustrating. It's frustrating for people like yourselves who are reading about the progress. It's, it's pretty frustrating for those of us who are involved in it. So I was involved in the development of alentuzumab as a treatment of MS, and that took 23 years from first giving it to someone with MS to it then being available on the NHS. So it's a huge long time. And there are lots of barriers that slow things down. Um, one of the barriers that doesn't exist is the enthusiasm of people with MS to be on trials. That really isn't a problem. Uh, the barriers are collecting money to do the trials in the first place, and then uh, regulatory hurdles, which are more and more onerous as you go through the process. Um, but also, and this is actually the most annoying and the most fixable thing you would have thought just the very business of getting together the people willing to do the trial the doctors and nurses and space to do it and time to do it in the nhs and that takes a frustratingly long period of time and the final point to make is that um, when when we do a trial we sort of build a machine to test a drug and then at the end of the trial we bash it up, you know, we say that's it, the machine's finished. And I think we're more and more realizing that this is a silly way to do trials. And what you need to do is build a machine to do trial number one. And then as trial number one is finishing, put trial number two in place in the same machine, same people, same kit, and keep going in that way. And, and that, for instance, is the thinking behind the octopus trial, which we might want to talk about. Interesting. Now, we mentioned um, the um, Cambridge Centre for Myelin Repair, which is obviously something very exciting. Um, could you tell us a little bit about remyelination and, and how that would work and the, the research that you've done so far? Yeah, so, I mean, the, the trials that have been done up until now that most people on this call will be aware of are trials of drugs to suppress inflammation in the brains of people with MS. And that is designed to stop any new damage being done. Uh, and that clearly is the first goal in the treatment of MS. Uh, but we're nearly there. I mean, we do have drugs which are very effective. So what most people with MS now have um, is a brain with old scars in and little chance of more damage. But those old scars 
now become a problem because those scars consist of areas of nerves that have lost their myelin, so demyelinated nerves. And a nerve without myelin is vulnerable and it will slowly degenerate. So the second goal of MS therapies now, and the thing that I'm focused on, is once the, the inflammation has been dealt with, can we rebuild the myelin around the nerves? Can we get over those scars and prevent nerves from degenerating? And the way that someone with MS might experience this is that uh, they might have a few attacks and be put on an effective therapy to suppress the inflammation. And then at some future time, when we have an effective remyelinating drug, they'd go on this second drug. And the hope would be that they would improve a little, their disability will improve, and they would not experience secondary progression, that they wouldn't experience that second phase. So that's now the goal of MS therapy. Well, that's very exciting. Um... So who can take part in clinical trials and where can people with MS actually find out about clinical trials? Because we, we do hear about these exciting things and then where do we go? <laughs> yeah, so I think this is a real problem. So I, you know, I'm very keen to recruit people into trials and there are lots of people with MS who want to be on trials and yet we seem to have a problem bringing the two together. Uh, and I think this is a genuine problem and, and we need to come up with solutions. So on a positive note, Every trial that is done has to be advertised on a publicly available website. Um, so clinicaltrials.gov, and I'll put that address in the chat so everyone can see it, um, it is available. And there is also one in Europe, an MH and an MHRA clinical trials directory. But to be honest, these are hard work to go through. They're really not easy. Mm. Uh, and the MS charities, including the MS Trust, have got a web page about clinical trials, uh, and those are good. But the trouble is, that it's hard work keeping them up to date. Yeah. Um, so we have a plan. Can I tell you about our plan? Oh, of course. Tell us all about your plan. <laughs> that, that hasn't been executed yet, but we're really keen to work with the MS Register and come up with a, a dashboard that works out whether individual people with MS who have submitted their data are eligible for any, any of the trials that are on offer. So that if, you're, um, if your details are on the MS register, you can just log on and see whether you're eligible for any of the current trials. Uh, and I think that's the way forward if we can get that working well. Yeah, that sounds like a good plan. Do keep us informed on that one and we can help yes, out. Yes, indeed. We indeed and the final thing to say just before we move on i'm very keen that people with ms are involved in trials in in advocacy for them and in understanding them and arranging things like this i think that's a really good way of getting news out there yeah um so quickly now before we our last question um what trials are you currently working on and are you looking well you've already said that you're looking to recruit so um tell us all about that yeah so uh, the, the, the trial that I'm keen on in, um, letting you know about, which is uh, in Cambridge only, uh, is a trial of two drugs which are really cheap and really available um, already on the NHS, and that's metformin, which is a treatment of diabetes, and clomastine, which is a treatment of hay fever. Um, and we think that metformin will wake up the stem cells that exist in everyone's brains, but in the people affected by MS don't seem to do anything. So metformin will wake them up, rejuvenate them, and then clomastine should trigger them to remyelinate. Uh, and that works in animals. So the question is, will it work in humans? So that's what we're doing. It's uh, 50 patients with MS who are on a disease modifying therapy, who are living roughly two hours from Cambridge, because this trial involves a lot of visits. Um, so we don't want to ask people from a long way away to be involved. Uh, but I'm very happy to be approached. My contact details are freely available. So if you fit the bill, please do contact me. And uh, I can also say that we've actually just recorded a podcast with um, um, one of your colleagues, Nick Cuniff, who's talking about the, leading the, that trial. And um, uh, he will talk more about the ins and outs of that trial and have more details on, on our website about it as well. Terrific. 
Terrific. So thank you so much for that. And if you have any questions uh, for Alistair, please pop them in the, the Q&A and we will um, talk about them uh, at the end of the session. Uh, and now I am going to hand over uh, to uh, Klaus, uh, who's going to talk to us about um, Chariot MS. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Helena, and for this um, lovely interview. Um, so I'm going to a monologue just a little bit, but um, obviously this is very much meant to be an interactive uh, evening. And um, I will go through relatively quickly so that people can ask their questions and, and, uh, and comment about it. So what I'm planning to do over the next 10 minutes or so is just briefly talking about um, treating MS as early and effectively as possible at any stage. Um, that was at least the original title. I think I'm going to focus on chariot MS, but if there's a little bit more time, I can also uh, talk about a smaller study um, uh, called Attack MS. I'm the chief investigator of both these, um, these trials that are um, one of them currently recruiting and one of them about to start recruitment. So let's talk about chariot MS. So chariot stands for Cladobin to hold deterioration in people with advanced uh, MS. And this is a scale that the neurologists annoyingly uh, used to use, which um, is a scale from zero to 10 that uh, essentially reflects the level of disability that people in um, uh, accrue over time uh, with uh, multiple sclerosis. And this is um, very much um, uh, figures based on natural history studies. So this does not quite reflect anymore um, how people actually develop uh, MS over time uh, since we have uh, uh, very effective treatments now. However, does not, that does not, um, uh, um, uh, 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 that is not true for those who are at a certain level of disability. Um, and that is largely people who are using a wheelchair uh, to, to, uh, to mobilize. And um, as you can see here, this is um, quite a large proportion of, the, uh, of you out there who have uh, never been uh, really enrolled in a disease modifying treatment uh, trial. And as a result of that, there's also been no availability of uh, disease modifying treatments for uh, your uh, MS at that stage. We call this advanced MS, which is an arbitrary term for people who are at this level here, uh, so-called EDSS 6.5. And so that's um, essentially the ability to walk for 20 meters with bilateral support um, and uh, above that. So we are um, trying to really change the uh, the approach to people with MS throughout the disease and that we don't exclude those who are in a wheelchair just because they're in a wheelchair um, from disease modifying treatment because upper limb function is incredibly important for um, quality of life, obviously not only when you're in a wheelchair, but certainly when you are, because then in, in, in some ways they become uh, your legs as well. Um, there was already mention of PPI, so that's um, really um, uh, people with MS and uh, more generally the public of invol uh, involvement. And here's Christine, who's been really supporting and helping um, uh, this project all along. And that means uh, a number of years that we've been uh, working on this together. I just want to briefly um, flag that this um, trial is, uh, or maps 100% um, really on a top priority that was identified a few years ago in a, um, a process called the James Lind uh, Alliance, the top 10 priorities of the MS Society. So which treatments are effective to slow, stop or reverse um, the accumulation of disability. But we're obviously also hoping that as a result of that, other elements that were felt to be so important um, uh, for, for you will be affected. So fatigue and um, cognition and pain, all of which are symptoms that if we can hold or um, uh, treat MS effectively should be positively um, uh, affected. We had to overcome some hurdles and this is a very technical slide. I appreciate that, but it is just to illustrate how uh, we um, established that 
the biological rationale over and above, um, you could call it sort of the equity between uh, uh, all people with MS, but the biological rationale to try and uh, treat people with an immunosuppressive or an immune modulatory uh, compound. Um, uh, and, uh, and that is based very much on uh, data like this. This is um, the largest data set that has been uh, accumulated about the question, how long does inflammation play a role in MS? And the, um, the figures cl quite clearly show uh, essentially throughout your life, because these are data based on the postmortem or tissue uh, bank in Amsterdam. Many of you will be aware there's one in the UK as well, um, uh, indicating that nearly 60% of the MS lesions that were detected in uh, that tissue were still um, inflammatory. So they were inflammatory cells, and this is not good if you have uh, MS. When you break this down differently um, on the basis of how many people actually did have or harbor uh, inflammatory um, lesions still in their brains, uh, the number even went up to 80%. So the assumption really must be that uh, uh, throughout uh, MS, inflammation plays an important role. Now, why clatterbin? Because Chariot um, uh, will test clatterbin. This is um, a list of reasons that um, made us choose this compound. Uh, first of all, it's a licensed treatment for people with relapsing disease or earlier disease. There is some evidence from earlier uh, studies that it is also effective in progressive um, uh, MS, but that has not been conclusive. Um, Professor Coles earlier mentioned the importance of distinguishing between phase two and three phase uh, three trials. It is very convenient. Um, it's a so-called immune reconstitution therapy, which is given uh, over a short interval um, with a long-term uh, effect. Um, we think it is a benefit that uh, it is a small molecule that actually acts within the brain alongside its uh, activity in the periphery. And by all intents and purposes, it is as safe as any of the highly effective uh, compounds that we currently uh, use in clinical practice. Um, in terms of safety, just to mention that there's uh, obviously in the in the context of the uh, pandemic, uh, there was a lot of uh, concern about you know, how is your immunity when you're exposed to the virus or to vaccination. And this is data from us together in uh, collaboration with uh, Emma Talentai and her team in, uh, in Cardiff, uh, indicating that the antibody generation following vaccination with clatterbin is essentially the same as with no, if you're on no disease modifying treatment. Uh, and also when it comes to breakthrough infection after in vaccination, clatterbin is sort of right in the middle here. So there doesn't seem to be an excess uh, risk associated with it. This is a quite a busy overview of the study. Um, so we're recruiting currently 200 participants. We're approaching 20, so 10% of those are uh, very soon going to be uh, on board. Um, um, these are the key inclusion criteria. We will use as primary outcome the 9 pec test, so an upper limb functional test. Um, that is uh, very different from uh, what is used to be uh, used, which is the EDSS, I've already mentioned. Um, as a number of what we call secondary outcomes. There's also MRI outcomes, um, which will support or not um, the effects and the efficacy of the compound, um, uh, the, or the clinical uh, parameters. We will look at health economics and uh, also uh, do um, some uh, laboratory studies uh, looking at the mechanistic um, uh, elements of the of the study. So nanopec test will be the primary outcome and the speed at which these nine pegs can be uh, inserted and withdrawn. Um, just to say that we have um, broad support from the MS community. These are the supporting organizations led by uh, the NIHR, um, uh, the EMI uh, program, but also the MS Societies uh, UK and US, Barts Charity and Merck that are producing, manufacturing, and supplying the drug. We had some seed corn funders uh, here from smaller organizations, and I'm very pleased that um, the, um, the MS Trust also supports the study. This is an overview of the study sites. Um, 
uh, they're going to be 20. Uh, the green ones are currently active, so they're green lighted. You can um, ask your consultant or your GP um, to refer you to one of those centers. Um, uh, or if you can't find your way through, then just email us uh, on this email. There's also, we have a website, um, uh, charides.com, which is slightly um, um, uh, disorganized at times, but it gives you the key information uh, that you need. And um, this just to say, here's our first patient illustrating also an element that is novel about the study. We're not only saying that you, you shouldn't be restricted because of your disability, but also your age. So um, Carol, she uh, was our first uh, recruit uh, in, and she is 70 years old. And um, here's, um, we also give medals to our um, uh, PIs. So this is Floriana De Angelis from Luton and uh, Helen uh, Ford from Leeds. And here's our most, one of the most recent patients who's just um, um, uh, joined us with his T-shirt and he happens to be a chariot driver, um, which is uh, obviously fantastic. And we're very pleased to have uh, Tim on board. So in this, um, um, where, with this, I'll, um, stop here and um, just leave again the contact uh, details there and I uh, would hand back to Helena and happy to take any questions or comments. Thank you. Taking a little while to remove the screen. There I am. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was really interesting. I, I love the, um, the that you actually have a chariot <laughs> driver involved in there as well. Yes. Um, <laughs> Um, that's not a requirement for being a part of the trial. Though. No, but we're yeah. obviously encouraging the, um, the, 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 ch the chariot um, drivers of the UK to join us all <laughs> in Sorry. this effort. Yes, in the, um, yeah. No, we're very happy to have Tim on board. That's amazing. Uh, we're going to make sure that we pop any links um, for uh, taking part of the trial. And it's nice to see that it's, you know, not just based in, in one centre as well. So because I think there was a few questions popping up I could see about do we have to get into London, but clearly not. Yes. No, it's across the country, really all nations of the UK involved and um, and um, just waiting for Belfast to turn green. Uh, it's only a matter of days, really. And then we have all country, uh, all nations. That's very, very exciting. So yeah, um, check the, the, the links uh, on our website for that later on. Um, and now we're going to uh, chat to Faisal um, about what it's like to take part in a, in a clinical trial. Um, there you are, hello. <laughs> Hi. So I've actually, um, I met Faisal because we were actually both part of, uh, of one of um, Professor Cole's um, clinical trials. Um, so um, I, I think he's a very good person um, to tell us all about the experience of it. So can you start by telling us why did you want to get involved in a clinical trial in the first place? Hi, Helena. Yes, um, I, I was diagnosed in 2013. Um, and after a, a kind of period of really burying my head in the sand, um, I kind of emerged and thought, actually, I want to try and do something um, to advance the cause basically um there was definitely a selfish element in there so when i heard about the trial that i took part in which we're going to talk about um i had this kind of vision of you know the the effects being amazing and the trial being halted after a month because everyone was suddenly being cured of ms so i had this kind of fantasy that was playing out in my mind as well but that attracted me to the idea of getting involved mm. yeah because this was one of the um um earlier um remyelination uh, trials that um Alistair was talking about. So obviously, if it if it would have worked, we it would have been um, remyelinated, um, which would have been fantastic. And the, the trial was a an interesting one to be a part of. Um, but when when was your sort of initial uh, concerns when you sign up? Because you do get a lot of information when you first um, look at it. Um, yes, yeah, so, so at the start, um, I, sorry, uh, sorry if I cast across you there. Um, yeah, at the start, <clears throat> um, I was uh, first told about it by my consultant in, uh, in Queen Square, and then I had an appointment arranged to go and see the team in Cambridge, at Um 
And uh, I think even before going, I received um, a lot of information. Um, and um, as you can imagine, and anyone that gets involved in trials, I think will get used to this. There's a very long list of the potential adverse effects and the downsides, almost as if they're trying to put you off taking part, which I know isn't the intention. Um, but I think it was important that the team was really clear about um, those risks, but also put them in proportion. So, you know, everything wasn't just a kind of scary list. It was weighted. There was evidence. There was some numbers around it. Um, but aside from that, um, the team was really clear about what's involved, how often I'd have to come to Cambridge, um, the um, types of activities that would be going on. So, you know, whether it be blood tests or um, a physical assessment, um, where to collect medicine, um, but above all, just a lot of reassurance around their availability. Mm. And how much time did you actually have to commit to, to taking part? Uh, it was over about um, nine months in total, I think, from memory. I'm starting to forget now, it was a few years ago. Um, and I think we were coming in um, every week for a while, for the first four weeks, I think. And then I think it was monthly for five months, something like that. And um, what happened during the trial, um, sort of when, when you went in for your, for your, for your meetings? Sure. So um, there would be um, a few standard things always. So a fasting blood test. So I'd always turn up for my one hour drive, um, you know, quite, quite hungry for something to eat. And there was always a great range of biscuits available afterwards, which was good. Um, so there would be a blood test, um, a, a physical examination, um, a kind of balance test that I think a lot of the MS patients will be used to um, doing. Um, and then um, uh, consultation. Um, uh, you know, with one of the team, either Nick or, uh, or Alistair. And um, then going to collect the uh, medicines um, from the pharmacy in the, in the hospital. And of course, you don't know if you're on the placebo or the real thing um, uh, initially. And I guess we can have that, a spoiler alert here because you were on the real thing, weren't you? And you did have some um, side effects. Can you tell That's us a right. bit about that? <laughs> yeah, sure. So, so after about um, a week, it was pretty obvious that I was on the real thing. Um, so um, some of the well-known common side effects happened to me. So uh, there was an impact on my thyroid function. Uh, my neutrophil levels dropped extremely low. Uh, my cholesterol levels went very high. Um, you know, it all sounds like quite a terrifying combination. So, you know, it was a good job the team had been very clear about that in advance and reassured that actually there were mitigating actions to take in all cases. So for me, the first thing was they reduced the dosage um, of the pills. Uh, and then I was on some other medications to help control those other, other side effects. Um, eventually, the dosage re was reduced even further, actually, after another week or so. Um, so it was, uh, so two things, I guess. One is, I knew for sure I was on the actual drug. Um, and secondly, uh, you know, it was quite an introduction to clinical trials because having never done anything like this before in my life, within two weeks of starting it, um, you know, I was getting kind of skin flaking and, you know, uh, hot flushes and all sorts of other things related to the kind of thyroid. Um, and on top of that, my GP was absolutely petrified because even though I told her about the um, trial, um, I don't think she really paid attention. So when she saw the first blood tests um, coming through with uh, cholesterol through the roof, et cetera, um, she was absolutely petrified. How did you feel, apart from the tests being really high and you were saying skin flaking, did you feel okay in yourself um, with the side effects? Yeah, ge generally generally okay. Uh, I, think I, I think one of the side effects was, um, was, was suddenly being very flushed. I think that was linked to the thyroid actually. So that was quite novel for me. Um, mm. But actually, for quite a lot of MS patients, from what I read, actually, it's, it's not so uncommon to have those kind of flushes. Um, it was more the logistics of it, I think, that was quite challenging. So the pills were very big. Um, mm. There were seven of them to start with. Um, it was quite an event at dinner time. You know, everyone kind of gathered around watching me, kind of trying to chug down enough water to get these, get these pills down. Um, so it was more that. Um, uh, that there was there was more of a challenge than actual symptoms. Skin flaking off was quite alarming, mm. um, but you know the good thing about that was, you know, I just picked up the phone and 
was directly in connection with, uh, you know, with Nick or with Professor Coles um, to talk about it. So you felt yeah. very supported by the team yeah. then. Yeah. Um, and once the trial had ended, how do you feel? Uh, I had mixed emotions. So um, it became quite an enjoyable routine to come up to Cambridge. Um, the team was really nice and um, a caring bunch of people and an interesting bunch of people. So, you know, so I genuinely enjoyed coming and spending time with them. Uh, and, and, you know, not just the, the scientists as it were, but, you know, the, the phlebotomist uh, was brilliant. Uh, the person who kind of coordinated, Karen, it was, was a really cool person. Um, so I, I, I was a bit sad actually to, to be ending the trial. Um, plus, you know, in the waiting room, we'd get to know people, I'd see you every now and again. Um, and, uh, and you develop kind of fellowship in that sense. It is a bit strange because you, you're in that environment and then it sort of ends. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Um, so the last question then, would you um, sign up to a clinical trial again? Yes, I would. Um, and, you know, it may seem odd that I was hit with all the side effects um, from, from the only trial I've ever been in. <clears throat> in a way, I think it's reinforced for me how important it is to do the trials, if you can, um, and how if it's a well-run trial, which I'm sure, or, you know, most trials are, um, it's, it's a bit like having two teams looking after you for the period of the trial. You know, I really felt that very strongly, um, and not just in relation to MS. So you know, there, there were things that came up occasionally in consultation that were nothing to do with MS or the trial. Uh, and the team was brilliant in, in handling those. So in your experience, would you recommend people to be involved? I would certainly recommend people to be involved in, uh, in clinical trials. I think um, there's no harm in pushing yourself forward because something to bear in mind, and I've just experienced this myself, is uh, screening may well exclude you anyway. So um, I know something that the people that run the trials really struggle with is just getting enough candidates in, enough people um, through the initial funnel. So I'd say, you know, if you're on the fence thinking about it, there's absolutely no harm at all in, in getting in touch with, 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 with anyone, any contacts that are running trials. Um, uh, even once you're screened positively, you know, there are many, many steps and many opportunities for you to say no for any reason. Um, or for the trial team to say, actually, you're not quite the kind of profile we're looking for. Um, so there's, I see no downside in, in putting yourself forward. Excellent. Thank you so much for telling us about your experiences. And um, then I would like to welcome all the panelists back and I'm going to ask you some questions. There's been quite a few. I've seen that there's been people asking in both the chat box and the Q&A, but I think we have got them all uh, collated now. Um, here's an interesting one, because we've been talking about um, uh, drugs purely. Um, so I guess this is a question for um, Alistair and, and Klaus. We hear a lot of research and trials into new drugs, but is there much research and trials taking place, things like diets um, or natural therapies? Um, <clears throat> I'm not so um, uh, familiar with current studies on um, herbal or diet, but I'm, I was just thinking of something um, completely different. Um, so that is off um, anything that you ingest. Uh, and, and, and here's obviously what, what um, uh, the neuron study, for example, and an intervention or a potential intervention, um, which is a cognitive uh, study. So it's tests actually a, <clears throat> a, an online cognitive um, training or an interaction and its impact on cognition. So that is um, a clinical trial, yes, but it is a intervention that is non-pharmacological um, at all. And I can only encourage anyone who is either in Nottingham, um, Cardiff, or in fact at Bath's to, uh, to, um, to join that. Yeah. <clears throat> um... I think there's been a few questions about links to trial websites, so, so we will do our best to <laughs> to post um, the ones that you've mentioned already and the um, what we have uh, from the MS Trust and the Society as well. 
Um, somebody is asking here, what reimbursement do you get for um, participating in clinical study? <laughs> yeah, so, um, you're not allowed to coerce people. That's one of the important things. So people, no one's going to make a, any, any money from taking part in a clinical trial. Um, what we are allowed to do is reimburse people for their expenses. So that usually in, just amounts to travel. Some trials will give us sort of um, an honorarium if they get, you know, halfway or all the way along. So that might be a book token or something like that. Um, but you won't get your salary reimbursed. You won't get your mortgage reimbursed. You won't, as one person asked for, get the cost of kenneling for their cat whilst attending a clinic visit reimbursed. I'm afraid we don't do that. Um, that's good to know. Thank you. Um, Here's a good question, and there's something we do see a lot. If the trial or the medication is working, can people continue on the medication after the trial is finished? This is very controversial. I'll let Klaus give his answer. I mean, sometimes there's just no issue because the trial, trial drug is an experimental drug and it takes a long time to work out whether it's been effective or not. And therefore, at the end of the trial, people really don't know whether it's the right thing to continue it or not. I have done a trial where there was literally no stock of any of that medicine anywhere in the world after we'd completed it. So that, you know, wasn't, couldn't continue. But um, what's more controversial is when you do these phase three trials, which are these large trials, which will lead to uh, registration and licensing. And in some of those trials, most of them not, but in some, the medication is continued. Yes, um, I think th this is a, this is a very important question because obviously, if something works, certainly in late stage phase two and phase and obviously in phase three trials, that is a key issue. Um, it depends also very much on how the drugs work, whether it is of high importance to actually retreat or continue to treat. Um, uh, or not. Um, for, I mean, the example of alemtuzumab is a very good one here in that <clears throat> it is being given in, a two, in two short courses. And then in many cases, you don't actually have to retreat. So you have a, a wonderful concept there that um, you, you, know, you, you, have, you, you have the treatment, you don't need further treatment, and, and the, the trial is, is being completed. I mean, that's the ideal situation. There are obviously um, uh, situations where you want to uh, continue and it depends very much really on the compound uh, because indeed there are some compounds you don't want to stop actually um, rapidly if, you're, um, if you put, um, ask people to actually take it in the first place. And um, this is something that's popping up in the box here, I can see, because obviously the chariot MS trial is for progressive MS, and we've, we heard a little bit about the octopus trial. Can we can we maybe talk a little bit more about octopus since um, um, it was mentioned? I see some people asking about it, and they ask also if they uh, can join the trial if they're already on DMDs. Yeah. Yes. So octopus yes. trial is is funded by the MS Society. It's a fantastic platform trial. So it's a bit like I was describing the the MS Society are building an engine which will do a trial of four drugs, three drugs or four drugs against placebo for a year or two. Then they'll look at the results and say, oh, we're going to drop that drug. We're going to drop that drug. We're going to bring in this drug, bring in that drug, and then run it for another couple of years, then drop this. And, and the idea is it just carries on. And this is for people with progressive MS and people are allowed to take the standard treatments for progressive MS and be in the trial. So you wouldn't have to stop any drug that your NHS doctor had given you. There's a website, so it's very Octopus Trial MS. Uh, type that into your search engine. Uh, you'll get a website where you can register yourself for it. It's, it hasn't started yet, uh, but it's imminent this year. Um, I think we've got so here's a question about another trial that we hear about sometimes. Um, how far along is the STAR trial and how is that going? Do we have any insight into that one? 
Yes, um, <clears throat> that's um, that's a good question, um, and I'm delighted to to share that um, uh, we, as as in Bart's um, Health, has just been activated as the fifth site in the UK um, recruiting for this uh, study, which is a um, um, a uh, trial testing um, uh, HSCT, so hematopoietic stem cell um, treatment versus um, either oculizumab, uh, alemtuzumab, or cladribin. So that is now activated, and uh, I think um, people should definitely express their interest. Um, we are aware, very much aware that many trials have been delayed um, through the pandemic, etc. So do get on um, the sites involved. Um, to, and so Sheffield is a lead site, so they, they also have a website about the STAR-MS trials, so do visit that, please. Excellent. I did see another question popping up, if there was any other research done into HSCT, um, apart from this one. <clears throat> Well, there is a parallel study in uh, going on at the moment in the US. Uh, I think these two um, uh, are the, the largest and hopefully most conclusive studies uh, on, on this issue, because we are obviously still there's a it's a it's a it's a bit of a marmite question at the moment. It's people are either very much strongly in favor or very critical of it. And I think it'll bring the two camps uh, perhaps closer together um, in uh, through through these. Uh, studies. Okay, um, here's a, a question, because um, if you're over 70, um, is there any trials that you can join? You know, this person has got the SPS. The octopus trial. Alice that wants to reply. <laughs> the octopus trial. <clears throat> yes. Uh, you, sorry, Alison? Well, all I was going to say, the octopus trial is specifically designed to be as inclusive as possible. Yes. So, if you've got progressive MS, you're almost certainly eligible for the octopus trial. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, so the octopus has um, the octopus team has taken a page from uh, from the chariot MS trial. There's no upper limit for um, for age. So um, there's obviously in exclusion criteria based on um, you know other comorbidities as in sort of additional conditions, etc. But that's the same for um, for any trial. But there's no a prescribed upper age limit. Um, and as I said in the presentation, our first um, recruitment or our first participant was indeed 70 years old. Very exciting, that's good. Um, here's an interesting one. Um, what new treatments can we expect neuros to be prescribing in the next few years? Can you repeat the question? Sorry. Yeah. What new treatments can we expect neurologists to be prescribing in the next few years? Um, Alice, said you want to come in first? Or, I mean, there's there's obviously um, some that have just been licensed. For example, the um, uh, a a uh, another uh, uh, compound that is similar to fingolimod or Jalendia or siponimod. Uh, Mazant, the new uh, compounds called Ponesimod, um, uh, and uh, so that is just come come uh, become available. I think there's also a, a better, to more tolerable uh, preparation of dimethylfumarate, is uh, diroximal fumarate that is um, currently under consideration. Um, I think not available yet, but I would expect that uh, to happen also uh, in the near future. Um, there's another um, uh, compound that is um, similar to rituximab or oculizumab called oblituximab. There's been uh, two phase three trials uh, reporting very positive results. And I would expect that that also is going to be uh, uh, available in the foreseeable future. Uh, there's lots going on, really. Um, also, when you're looking at the already established drugs, um, for example, natalizumab, uh, Tysabri has become available as a subcutaneous injection. So there are also so sort of minor or smaller changes that are, I think, still to the benefit of um, you know um, the administration, comfort, um, convenience, etc., uh, with very similar efficacy. Alistair, do you want to say anything on this one? Well, my answer would be slightly different. I think if you're diagnosed with MS in 10 years' time, you're going to be given a handful of tablets, um, which will be anti-inflammatory, 
remyelinating and neuroprotective. And the experience of having MS will be taking lots of tablets, having lots of blood tests, but not getting disabled. That sounds um, promising. So 10 years, did you say? 10 years. So a bit like rheumatoid arthritis now. So if you've got rheumatoid arthritis diagnosed now, you will not get disabled from it. You will not, but you'll have a lot of trouble from taking a lot of medications, having lots of blood tests. So that will be the burn. Yeah. Um, we have a question for Faisal. Um, is there any tips that you would give to people who are thinking about um, uh, signing up for a trial? Sure. Um, first tip, uh, this might be really obvious, so forgive me, but first tip would be talk to your existing consultant. Very likely they'll know uh, about the trial and they'll and, and or they'll know the team behind it. Um, secondly, do read through the kind of quite detailed and sometimes a bit dull um, pack that you get sent uh, with information. Uh, and I would suggest have a highlighter. Literally just pick out any things that, that, that you know, catch your eye and you, you're, you're concerned about uh, or you're interested in. Um, and then um, raise those fully with the trial team when you go to see them uh, for you know initial screening or initial discussion. Um, do I would really, you know, in terms of a tip, I would say do not hold back in whatever you're feeling or thinking about the trial, and don't feel like oh it's silly or you know you're being naive or whatever. Just you know if you're worried about dying from a you know a sudden brain malfunction or something because this appears to be suggested by the trial documentation, ask about it, definitely. Um, I, would, I would say so just be as open as possible. Mm. Yeah, no questions are too silly, are they? Well, it's just, okay. Right, I think it's a final question, which um, is a, it's a big one. Um, and the person says, I know this is a huge question and, the, and nobody knows what the future holds, but Bex, on what experts currently know and what advances in medicine realistically can happen. Uh, do you think that we can see a cure in MS in our lifetime? Well, I, um, I would argue from the um, perspective of what a, what a cure is, okay? And um, it depends on really um, how, how, you, how you define that. Um, I think that there are some patients that may well have already been cured. Um, of disease onset and they are in long-term remission. So that means they've been in remission for 10 years, 15 years and beyond. I think the, the, the reason why we cannot call it cure as yet is simply because we don't have the, 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 the time, the, the follow-up that um, will allow, uh, allow that. And Alistair? Yeah, I, I want to say no. I think it's dangerous to talk about a cure. Uh, and there are two reasons for saying that. Firstly, there isn't a, any other autoimmune disease which has been cured. Um, so why should we cure MS? And if you look at something like rheumatoid arthritis, that's not cured, but it's very effectively treated. So that was my second point. Um, I think if we say that people are cured after this or that treatment, then we take our eye off the ball and potentially that person runs into trouble later on. So I think we've got to always be vigilant to the possibility of MS coming back and always keep an eye on folk in case they need further treatment. But I do see a future where MS will not cause disability and very few relapses. It'll just be a bother of taking lots of treatment. Thank you so much to um, both of you. That it is a very tricky, <laughs> tricky question, but I think we've learned lots of interesting things and there's been lots of talks about different trials um, and we will get uh, everything together for the email that will go out later on um, that will have all the links. And um, I guess that brings us to uh, the end. Um, it's gone very fast, I feel like. <laughs> um, the MS Trust has got lots of information on what the clinical trials are like and how MS research works. We also have an MS research update that you can sign up for. Um, 
and they're listed on this slide here. Don't worry if you don't have time to note them down because we'll include all the links in the follow-up email that we're sending out um, with the webinar recording including all the trials that I've mentioned in this session. Um, and I'm very sorry if your question didn't get answered. Um, please feel free to contact the, the MS Trust Inquiry Service. It's available from Monday to Friday, except UK bank holidays from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. And outside of these hours, you can leave us a message mm -hmm. and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Uh, you can call us on 0800 032 3839, or you can email us at ask at mstrust.org.uk. I want to thank you, everyone who's attended, and thank you so much to all our speakers and our panelists for this very interesting information that we've heard this evening. And I really hope that you found this session useful. Thank you.